and a bus driver was whipping it up this mountain. This is a double-decker bus going 60 miles an hour up these curvy roads. Hong Kong has been a place that has been on our radar for a really long time. When I heard that the Hong Kong Tourism Board was giving away free round trip tickets to Hong Kong, I was like, this is our opportunity to finally visit Hong Kong, potentially for free. And of all the places we've been, Hong Kong has got to be one of the most unique. For starters, just look at it. It's two islands separated by a giant river with no bridges across it. But this place is one of the most densely populated in the world. The public transit works great and it is extremely affordable. You won't even know the river's there. The more southern island is Hong Kong Island. This is where most of the financial buildings and skyscrapers are, but across the way is Kowloon with an amazing view of the Hong Kong side of the island. The one thing that stands out the most to me about Hong Kong is that it has the architecture of an East Asian city, but the palm trees of somewhere tropical, and so many of the people speak basically perfect English, especially the younger generation. You'll glance at people's phones and all the menus are in English and they're texting their friends in English. It was really something striking to me. It stood out. So I'm going to start with some descriptions of different areas, but feel free to hop around the video if you want itinerary ideas, where to take the best photos, stuff like that. Hey, you, look down. You see that subscriber number? Have you ever seen a subscriber number so low before? All you have to do is click that subscribe button and you will make me the happiest person ever. Click, click, click. Since our Hong Kong trip was relatively impromptu, one of the first things we did was look at areas to stay. And when you start looking into it, you realize Hong Kong's really not that big. The Southern Island is just dense population squeezed between mountains to the south and a river to the north. And then the Northern Island, which is known as Kowloon, is a little bit more spread out, but honestly, it's more of the same. No matter where you stay, I would recommend putting your hotel location into a maps app and just seeing how long it takes to get from the airport to the hotel. And specifically looking at walking time, you really don't want to be lugging your bags around too far if you're going to take public transit, which I would recommend because there's an express train right from the airport to downtown Hong Kong. Now one thing to note for Hong Kong, we use City Mapper a lot and the main reason is that normally we use Google Maps but Hong Kong's filled with these little subways that go under the main street so you'll walk down and walk under a main street and walk back up the other side and Google Maps doesn't seem to know about a lot of these so Google Maps might tell you oh this is a 15 minute walk when in reality it's only five minutes. So we stay near the Wan Chai or Causeway Bay area but you can really stay anywhere and be fine just due to how easy it is to get around. So what are the main areas? I already mentioned Wan Chai and Causeway Bay because that's probably the biggest area and it has the most stuff to do. This is probably me and Tiffany's favorite area also. There's all the shopping you could ever imagine. There's street food booths, there's bakeries, there's cafes, there's street markets, there's malls. If you don't decide to stay in this area, definitely at least pay it a visit. One kind of unique thing that stood out to me about this area is that there's basically no distinction between being inside and outside. We went to Hong Kong in late December, early January, and the temperature was like mid 70s Fahrenheit the whole time. So if that's as cold as it gets, then the malls don't really need doors or anything. One second you're on a sidewalk and the next you're going up or down an escalator and there's also a ton of the famous hong kong trams in this area so if you're looking to get some pictures on those trams this is probably the best area to do it just because the crowds and the architecture it's kind of got that iconic hong kong look to it but these trams run along the harbor the entire way across hong kong island so you won't have to look far if you're looking for these trams you really can't miss them okay next area i'll mention is central this is kind of the transit hub this is where all the trains and ferries pass through to get across the river bay harbor they call it a harbor but it looks like a river to me anyway you also find ferries to macau and mainland in China here as well as the central bus terminal for going to places like the peak. And this is where we found some of the best coffee shops, specifically a little further west in Shengwan. And by the way, these areas are not that far apart. I mean, this island is so tightly packed. To give you an idea, getting from central to Causeway Bay is maybe seven minutes by train. And Shengwan would be like 10 tops. If you have a place you want to check out, you can get there, no problem. And it's seriously so cheap. You can hop on a bus, train, tram. Trip is going to cost you maybe six Hong Kong dollars. And the tram or bus is probably half that price. It's so easy to get around. Like most major cities, it uses like a tap in, tap out system they have a thing called the octopus card you can pick one up in most major stations i got mine at central it also works on buses it'll work on the vans up in the mid levels you can pay at most shops with it loading it is cash only so you need to find an atm but when we left in late december they had just finished rolling out their visa program so you can pretty much tap into any subway with apple pay or google wallet and usually they even give you a discount for paying that way so i mentioned the mid levels that's basically an area a little bit further south in hong kong more up in the hills it gets very mountainous very quickly so for a long time they only built like on the flat part right next to the river but i guess more recently they started building up into the mountains more so that's referred to as the mid levels and the staple public transit in this area is like a little van you can hop in it's super cheap and they are completely bombing it down these hills that's for sure a fun experience but the area itself is pretty residential so i can't really think of much that stood out for a reason to go here but when we hiked down the peak it was kind of on the way back so we walked around for a little bit anyway that was kind of a tangent one last area i want to talk about is kowloon which is basically everything north of the river i'm sorry i'm just gonna call it a river and again just to give you an idea getting across the river from hong kong to kowloon station 
transportation is maybe a five minute ride and it'll cost 10 Hong Kong dollars. So again, it's really nothing to be intimidated by. When we first booked our hotel, I was a little weirded out by the river because a lot of places you go, like we were in Seoul, for example, almost everything you want to do in Seoul is north of the Han River. And once you go south, everything feels kind of spread out. Hong Kong is not like that at all. And one thing I have to mention, there is a ferry that goes back and forth from the Hong Kong side to the Kowloon side. It's like every five minutes and seriously costs like five Hong Kong dollars. You just tap your oyster again, you're treated to an amazing 10 minute ride across the river and you can get some of the best views on this ferry. You got to do this at least once or twice. Okay. So knowing all that, it'll probably come as no surprise that the Kowloon side is more or less the same as the Hong Kong side. You're going to find more malls, more shopping, more places to eat. <laughs> Equally as crowded, if not more crowded in a lot of cases, the malls are maybe bigger and maybe there's a couple more green spaces. And of course they've done an amazing job with the entire boardwalk, which looks over Victoria Harbor at the skyline. And this is probably one of the best places in Hong Kong. We came here at all times of day just to see the skyline in different light. We were also there during Christmas time, which meant there were decorations everywhere. There's also Christmas markets and probably more crowds. And there were also nightly fireworks shows over the harbor. We showed up to one. I thought I was going to get crushed against a rail in the Sim Sha Sui area. <laughs> Sorry, the name doesn't roll off the tongue. I think people call it TST. Next thing I'm going to talk about is the food. And then I'll finish off by talking about some of the activities we did. So for food, you have so many options. I would say my impression of the food here is it consists of a lot of noodle dishes. Tiffany was a big fan of the Don Don noodles, which is like a spicy ground meat on top of the noodles. And another staple, of course, are the dim sum places. We love dim sum, but we we kind of stuck to the two major chains. You'll see them everywhere. One's called Din Tai Fung and the other one is Crystal Jade. Both are delicious meals. You'll have a lot of steamed bun dishes as well as more noodle dishes there. I really can't complain about the food in Hong Kong. It's all very good. One thing I will note though is it's a little expensive. Definitely closer to US or EU prices. We just spent a lot of time in Japan and South Korea and I was pleasantly surprised at how cheap food in those countries was. Like you could spend $10 a day and be fine or splurge on a fancy meal for $20. Hong Kong, you can probably expect closer to $4 dollars a person per day. I'd say that's pretty reasonable. We cheap out a little bit and hit up convenience stores for some meals, but generally I think that's a fair number for average meal cost. On the topic of food, I'll bring up the food stalls that are basically everywhere. There's this chain that makes these steamed buns. It's so nice to be able to just grab a bun wherever you are. You'll see them all along the roads and in the subway stop. And of course, there's the now global phenomenon, the Hong Kong waffle. Now, one of our favorite places that we went to every single morning, right in Causeway Bay, there's a place called Bakehouse. I think they have a couple other locations. Egg tarts were so good and we branched out a little bit towards the end and everything we had was delicious. There's a line out the door at all hours of the day, but they'll move you through pretty quickly. Like the longest we waited was probably five minutes. Other than that, there's cafes all over. If you're a coffee lover, I think the best spot was Sheng Wan. They have a lot of, I guess, call them like Melbourne style cafes. I don't really know what that means. I think it just means delicious coffee and like brunch style items you can eat. There's another bakery in this area called Bread is Life. It's got a cool aesthetic. So you can easily pop in and grab some baked goods. Always got to try the egg tarts though. One of the last things, kind of a rolling recommendation, and will most likely vary based on when you look at it is to check out the Hong Kong Tourism Board to see what kind of promotions they have. When we went, they gave us 100 Hong Kong dollars to various bars and restaurants. So check out their website before you go or at the airport, you can stop by the Tourism Board office and pick up a voucher if they're offering a current promotion at that time. Okay, final thing I'll talk about is activities in no particular order. First thing that came to mind was the Nongping 360. I don't know how Tiffany keeps making me get on these cable cars, but this was a real terrifying one. The whole cabinet itself is made of plexiglass basically so you can look straight down and it's at least a 30 minute ride over bodies of water through the mountains you name it But once you get to the top, it's such a beautiful scenic area. There's a little town. There's a huge temple. There's a path that leads out into the woods and then up into the mountains. And then you get to the top and it's a beautiful scenic area. It leads to some giant stones with some wisdom on it that I couldn't understand. But the main attraction is this giant Buddha. You walk up this giant staircase. I counted the steps. I think it was like 240. But if you push through and make it all the way up, this Buddha is awe-inspiring. Just the pure scale of it. This is a day trip I really recommend. You could probably do it in a half a day. The lines to get on this 
this gondola for so long. We probably spent an hour and a half in line and that was pre-buying tickets. Again, though, it was Christmas time. I don't know if that's reflective of how crazy it always is. Okay, next on the list is the famous Hong Kong escalators. <laughs> this is something I insisted we do, but it was really just a dumb little side attraction. Basically right by Central, you can take a ride on what I think is the world's longest escalator or it's like a series of escalator. You're on a little walkway that goes above the main road and you're just taking escalators up all the way into the mid levels. There's maybe some shopping and some food along the way, but I'll be honest, you get to the top and you're like, okay, well, I guess we'll just go back down. But hey, it was a fun experience. Okay, next on the list, Kowloon Walled City Park. This is actually the last thing we did, but it was just so memorable just for how crazy of a story it is. The history behind this is that when the British made a deal with China for Hong Kong, there was this little area about 20,000 square meters that China technically owned. And if you don't know how big that is, let's just say not that big. You could probably walk end to end in five minutes or like walk the perimeter in maybe 15 minutes. Anyway, the story is that it was technically owned by China, but it's so far away from mainland China that they didn't really end up governing it at all. So what ended up happening is this place became the most densely populated place in human history. I think there were estimates up to 50,000 people living here. And these buildings were all shoddily built. Like there was never any plan. It was, okay, we're going to build a room and then we're going to build another room. And oh, we need another room. And these buildings got up to 14 stories high. And apparently you could walk the whole city on the upper floors without ever getting the ground level. It's a really crazy story. I'll link a video we watched on the entire history of it below. But all that's left now is this beautiful park where you can kind of get an idea of what it would have been like to live there. Craziest part really is that it was demolished in like the early 90s. So you think about it, somebody living there in their 20s would probably be like in their 50s today. It was really not that long ago. Just a completely mind boggling story. If it's something that interests you, it's a little out of the way, but I would say it's worth going. Okay, brief mention that you can easily get to Macau with a one hour boat ride. I started this video saying Hong Kong was a crazy place. Macau is probably even more crazy and surreal to me. Plan on making a separate video for that. So if you made it this far, maybe subscribe and check that video out. We just did this as a day trip, but I would really recommend going for more time. There's a lot to do and see. There's no shortage on places to shop in the Hong Kong area. It felt like everywhere we walked, we were surrounded by designer stores, malls, one size fit all boutiques. We visited pretty much the week of Christmas. And so I don't know if it was the time of year that we visited, but we did notice everywhere we were going, we were seeing a lot of collabs. There was a collab with like Neopets going on. And then there was also a collab with Pokemon. So definitely check out some of the arts and installations that they'll have for some of those collabs. While I ended up getting free round trip tickets, Matt unfortunately did not. He ended up having to connect through London while I snoozed on a nonstop flight. I arrived in Hong Kong a day before Matt did. So I figured not having Matt around was the perfect opportunity to go and shop in my own leisurely style. One of my favorite things was checking out all of the one size fit all boutiques. It's really popular format of a store in a lot of Asian countries. And while it's a great way to get cost effective clothes, it is a little bit hard as a foreigner shopping at some of these stores, especially since a lot of the stores don't necessarily offer refunds or allow you to try on in store. One thing that I did appreciate was a lot of the stores had tape measures so you could measure to make sure it's at least in a ballpark that would fit. But for the most part, I typically steer away from pants and mostly opted to buy shirts, sweaters, dresses. Um, I'm actually wearing a sweater that I picked up and it feels pretty cozy. Definitely proceed with caution. They pretty much just had one item out on the floor and once you were ready to check out they would head to the back and end up picking out each individual item for you and bring it back to you in this plastic bag it almost reminds me of Shein and if they happen to not have any more in the back they did offer the option for you to inspect the item and purchase it so even if you aren't an avid shopper like myself walking through the malls in Hong Kong is definitely a fun experience especially during the Christmas time everyone's out and about and the malls really go all out with their decorations it's a really cool vibe here are these people who just brought their dogs and cats to the mall and I was taking videos and photos of them and someone came up to me and asked if I was a tourist and told me they were super glad I saw it because this is the most Hong Kong thing that you'll ever see but you'll find these giant endless malls anywhere and I don't know why I just find it so enjoyable to walk around malls you never know what kind of stores you're gonna find okay I'm gonna briefly go over some good spots to take photos number one for me is this place called the monster building it's a residential area so I kind of feel weird about recommending to take photos there especially because there's signs all over that say don't take photos but at the end of the day there's just residents kind of sitting around the square watching everybody take their photos and there's a lot of people taking photos so as long as you're respectful and quiet for the people that live there I don't think it's gonna be too big of a deal but this photo is like the classic Hong Kong photo I think there was like a scene in a Transformers movie shot here something about the cramped space and the architecture just makes it look so dystopian that's probably the main photo you'll have to go out of your way for tram photos shots of the harbor shots of the skyline those are all classic but you'll probably end up at some of those places at some point anyway now another activity slash good photo spot is getting up to Victoria Peak also known as the peak and you can look down at the skyline and over at Kowloon from above and this is kind of 
kind of a trip on its own. It's got this huge mall at the top. We got these crazy souffle pancake that Tiffany just had to have. It's Santa saving the elves from this rooftop or something. I don't know. Point is, there's a bunch of stuff to do on the peak of this mountain, so it's worth the trip up. And at the top of the mall is this observation deck where you can get the photo you're looking for. But let's talk about getting up there. You can basically take a normal city bus from Central all the way to the top. It's like a 20 minute ride. Again, it's like 10 Hong Kong dollars. I don't know if all the buses are like this, but ours had the color scream of Grimace from McDonald's and the bus driver was whipping it up this mountain. I don't get scared easily, but this is a double decker bus going 60 miles an hour up these curvy roads on this mountain. I sat on the bottom and I was closing my eyes trying not to look out the window. But if you're a daredevil, feel free to sit up top. Okay, this video has gone on long enough. My terrifying bus story feels like a good note to end on. Let me know in the comments if I missed anything. We had a pretty quick trip, been about seven days total, and I feel like we easily could have filled more time if we wanted. It was such a joy every single day and there was so much to do. I'll definitely be taking the next opportunity I have to come back. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.